All right, brethren, I want to deal this morning with one of the, one of the Beatitudes in the Bible. Now, uh, what is a Beatitude? Someone give me a different word for that, because sometimes we may not even know what that even means. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the man. But, yeah, so what's a Beatitude then? It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a blessing. It's to say this person is blessed. So when we talk about the Beatitudes in the Scripture, um, that's not a normal vocabulary word. So we're, we're dealing with when Christ pronounces blessings upon people. For some, you know, we, we know the ones in uh, the Sermon on the Mount, right? These are the ones we typically have in our mind, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those kinds of things. We know those, right? So I want to deal with, with one of these Beatitudes, but not one of the ones that is, we see in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, I want to deal with one that I think is just almost completely forgotten, uh, that, it, that it even is really a Beatitude, that it is a pronounced blessing of the Lord Jesus. And there are, as you know, a few hidden ones in the Scriptures, and I've dealt with some of these over, over the years, right? Uh, blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Uh, I've dealt with this in the past. Uh, those who can uh, receive Christ's goodness and not be offended by His purposes and His plans, that is a blessed individual. That's one of those sort of hidden beatitudes. Uh, blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. I've dealt with this in the past before too, right? The eyes that can see the glory of Christ and the ears that can hear and receive the message of Christ, they are blessed, supremely blessed. But I want to deal with uh, one that's a bit different. In fact, the one that I want to deal with comes after all of these. It, it is, in fact, the last beatitude that Jesus gives before He ascends to glory. Um, and brethren, this one, th this beatitude for me individually and, and maybe for you after today, rises above all the others. It is a place for me of supreme comfort and joy. And the reason for that, brethren, is because in this life we are called by the Scripture to walk by faith and not by sight. And brethren, that can be, that can be difficult to do that. And I think the Lord Jesus knows that that can be difficult to do. And we can, we can often feel, just like we sang a minute ago, that our faith will fail. And you know, brethren, this, this beatitude that we're going to consider this morning, I think that we can know that even in the midst of those kinds of difficulties, uh, the, because of our lack of sight and our necessity to walk by faith, I think we can know that Jesus looks upon us with compassion. But not only that, brethren, He looks upon His disciples and He pronounces blessing upon them. And I don't know about you, brethren, but I need that at times. I need that from the Lord Jesus. And so many of you, I've already talked about this a lot. So this might be a pointless question to ask. Maybe some of you can refrain for a minute. Those of you who don't know what text I'm dealing with this morning, can you guess which beatitude I want to look at? Any guesses? Yeah, it's, it's the last blessing, the last beatitude that Christ gives before He ascends to glory. Yes, yes. Yes. So it, it, it comes to us in John 20. So I want you to go there. John chapter 20. I was grateful that someone knew it. Many of you have cornered me this week and have forced me to, to reveal my secrets. So some of you already knew what I was going to preach on, but Nevertheless, the, the, it comes to us in John chapter 20. It's an interaction between Thomas and Jesus. And I'm going to read the whole section here. John 20, starting in verse 24. Now, Thomas, <clears throat> one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them <clears throat> when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. 
But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So here we have this this blessing bestowed by our Lord. And, And as I said before, it is the final beatitude that He gives before He ascends now to glory. And brethren, as is said really about all men and all women, as they are about to depart from this world, every word they speak carries with it a certain weight above everything else they would have spoken before. And here our Lord is no different, brethren. Before He now ascends to glory, He speaks these words to to these disciples, to those, and, and, and He's referencing here a blessing upon those who have not seen as Thomas did and yet have believed. And He says, they are blessed. Brethren, these words, they, they carry with them their own, their weight in gold to all those who fall under its banner. And so I want to consider a few different things here. Three aspects that I want to think about of this beatitude. First, I want us to consider who is this for? If there is blessedness to be had, is it for us? This is going to be crucial for us, brethren. Secondly, I just want us to consider the sheer glory of this blessing. I want us to bask in its benefits, to receive all that we can from the blessing Jesus gives here. And and then thirdly, I want you to think about the reason for such a blessing. Why are they blessed? Those who have taken no part in the things spoken of in the Gospels, who have never seen any of these things and have seemingly believed on blind faith. Why are they blessed? And we're going to look at that as well. So the the first thing is this then. Who's the blessing for, right? Of whom does Jesus speak? And we could really look at this simply because three ways, brethren, that we might apply this verse. And there's three ways in which people throughout history have sought to apply what Jesus says here. There are some who would say that Jesus speaks of people in the past, that He speaks of the blessedness of those who, like it says there in Hebrews 11, they died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar. Hi. (laughs) thought she was going to come in. (laughs) So in one way, Jesus, some some are arguing that Jesus is here pronouncing a blessing on those who came before him, right? That they longed to see his day, but they didn't see it. And yet they still believed solely based on the promises of God of what would come in the future. There are others who would argue that Jesus' words here are a reference to those at the present time. Those people alive in the day of Jesus who had believed in His resurrection, who had believed that Jesus was indeed the Messiah based upon the testimony of others. Not because they had themselves seen it, right? They had not seen Jesus as Thomas was now seeing Him, and yet they still believed that Jesus was the Messiah and that Jesus had resurrected from the dead because of the testimony of the apostles or the testimony of others. And then there are yet others who would argue that Jesus speaks here about those who would come in the future. He speaks of those who would come to believe in Him based on the words of the apostles and and the words of others on into the future. That even though they have never seen the Lord Himself or any of the things spoken about in the Gospels, they would still believe 
They would not have the position that Thomas had here, where they could touch the physical wounds of Jesus. But nevertheless, brethren, they would come to believe that it was those very wounds that bought them and redeemed them. Now, you have these, these three possible ways of looking at it. And brethren, to all this, I just, I just say amen. Yes. The answer is yes, right? The blessing is to all those who have never seen and yet believe. This is the principal matter that Jesus has in mind when he pronounces this beatitude, brethren. Are the saints of old blessed? Because even though they only saw it from afar, they still believed? Of course they are. Of course they are. Are those people blessed in the days of Jesus who believed that Jesus was the Messiah, who believed that he had raised from the dead, not because they had seen it, but because they had heard the message from another? Undoubtedly they are, brethren. Undoubtedly they are, because the blessing applies to them. And now for you, the question of supreme importance is, are you blessed? Supremely blessed, because even though you have never seen the Lord Jesus, nor nor any of the things spoken about Him in the Gospels. Yet you still believe. You make the same confession, brethren, that Thomas made, that Jesus is your Lord and your God. And you do so, brethren, not because you have seen with the physical eyes, but because you have seen with the eyes of faith. Brethren, blessed are all those who fall under this category of people who believe even though they've never seen. And furthermore, I think Peter, he certainly he was here when this took place. He heard the blessing of Jesus upon those who had not seen and yet believed. And so Peter remembers this blessing and he applies it when he writes his letter that first Peter, what we just read in our reading. He wants to share it with those whom he writes. And brethren, you got to keep in mind here, those people to whom Peter writes, they are in the future of when Jesus had pronounced this blessing. And yet I think Peter has it in his mind and he wants to remind his hearers of this thing when he writes to them, right? What did he say to them? He says, though you have not seen him, you love him. He says, though you do not now see him, you believe in Him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Brethren, what a thing. What a thing that you have never seen this Jesus and yet we love Him. And I think that this is something for Peter. That, that would seem impossible for him to enter into. And that's why I think he commends it in these believers. Right? You've got to think about this, brethren. Peter did not have to live in this realm like you and I live. You realize this, brethren, that Peter, even after Jesus' ministry was done, he ascended into glory. As Peter would go and he would close his eyes to enter into prayer, he could see the face of Jesus. You cannot do that. But Peter, he knew his Lord intimately. He had seen him. He could recall the stories that we read in the Bible, and he could visually see them in his mind. Now, we could try to do that, but you don't know exactly what it looked like. But Peter did. Peter could remember what it was to stand on water by the power of Jesus upholding him. He could see the face of his Lord in his mind as he would pray. He knew him intimately, brethren. He knew the Savior's love for him. He knew it in a very real way, a way that you and I have not had the opportunity to have. For Peter, brethren, it very much was that because he had seen him, he loved him. And because he had seen him, he believed in him. And now he writes to a people who are so foreign from that concept. They have never seen Jesus. They have never seen any of the things spoken about in the Gospels. And yet they believe and they rejoice and they endure suffering and they're filled with inexpressible joy and glory. Brethren, this is you. This is who Peter is talking about in the Bible when he says, 
You have not seen him and yet you love him. And you, you still don't see him and you just believe in him. What a blessing, brethren, that you've never seen him and yet you love him. I mean, brethren, can you imagine? It, if you love him as you love him now, how much will you love him when you see him? Brethren, the glory that we await. You know, I find it so encouraging in this passage as Peter writes to the church that the result for him is no different than the result for us. Oh, Peter had a a blessed opportunity to, to see things that we've never seen and to be part of that ministry that we had never been a part of. He saw much more than we ever will, brethren. But you know what? He receives nothing better for it. At the end of it all, we receive the same thing Peter receives, the salvation of our souls based on faith. Peter receives nothing different than us because he had saw something different than us. And in fact, if anything, based upon our text this morning, we receive a blessing beyond that of Peter. You receive an extra blessing from the Lord because you believe even though you have never seen. Brethren, I want you to grasp the glory of this. I'm telling you, brethren, this this ought to be one of the greatest treasures ever dug out of the Scriptures. Um, There's there's a handful of verses in the Bible that bring me the sort of joy and peace that this verse brings. I mean, this is the kind of thing that as as you read it maybe one morning, it ought to cause weeping and laughing all at the same time. Brethren, I can tell you with certainty that at times in my Christian life, I have clung to this verse with dear life. And I can assure you that it can hold the weight. Brethren, this statement alone can hold up the weakest of saints for an eternity. Because when we find it, brethren, difficult at times to to press on in faith because we haven't seen. In seasons where the devil would seek to assail you with doubts and questions, Brethren, I would bid you to flee to this passage. Our Lord looks upon you with compassion and pronounces you blessed because you remain faithful to Him even though you have not been able to see what others have seen. And in fact, the point that Jesus would have us to see is that you are blessed beyond those who had the privilege of seeing. And you know, brethren, that can be, that can be difficult for us to believe. I mean, it's, it, it's so hard to grasp because it's kind of like, and I was talking with, with Minas about this, but it, it's kind of like that passage where you get Jesus telling his disciples that he's going to go away and it's better for him to go away and ascend to the Father because he will send the Spirit. And you've got to think, brother, the disciples are like, What are you talking about? I don't think it's better that you go away. I think it's better that you stay. And Jesus is saying, no, it is better that I go away. There is a greater blessing that you will have if I go. And so we come to this text, brother. it's it's kind of the same way with this passage, right? I, I don't know, maybe you're not like me, but I think, brethren, that those who were able to see Right? Those like Thomas and and Peter and James and John and these disciples of Jesus, they had a more blessed position. They were really blessed because they got to see these glorious things that took place in in the Gospels, right? And yet this text would have us understand completely the opposite. In a sense, it's as though Jesus is saying, you actually are better off having not seen. You receive a greater benediction from the Lord Jesus because of the fact that you haven't seen and yet believe. But brethren, I mean, how hard is that to grasp? Do you feel like that? I don't feel like that all the time. In fact, I probably rarely ever feel like that. I often feel like I would rather see I would rather see and then believe rather than just believe and not see. I mean, am I alone in that kind of thing? I mean, brethren, you think about the Gospels. 
What sort of things, as you read through those Gospels, brethren, what sort of things would you have loved to see? The Sermon on the Mount. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that happen in the Gospels, brethren. Surely there are things that you've read them and you thought, what well, I would have liked to have seen that. I mean, brethren, when Jesus, Jesus comes and he, he walks to the disciples, he's walking on water. I mean, just to, to see that and the, filled with awe and terror of such a thing. And then, and then he speaks to the wind and he says, stop. And everything just obeys him. Nature just obeys the word that comes out of this man's mouth. I mean, what a sight, brethren. What a sight. What if you were to see when Jesus heals that paralyzed man, they drop down through the roof. And you see this man has never used his legs. And then immediately he stands up, he begins to walk. I mean, brethren, you think your eyes are deceiving you. You think that somehow this is a lie, this can't be real. Or Jesus feeding, feeding the thousands on the mountainside. I mean, brethren, talk about miracle of miracles, right? Five loaves, two fish, 15, 20,000 people. How is this possible, brethren? How is this possible to, that this is taking place? I mean, one thing is for sure, brethren, you would never forget it to your dying day. And you know, if I could pick anything, brethren, I, I think... I, I think I would pick the Sermon on the Mount too, to hear Jesus' teaching, to hear those words come from his mouth. Brother, you know what was said about him? He came down off of that mountain after he preached there. It says, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority. Not like the scribes. I mean, can you imagine what it would have been like, brethren? The words of Almighty God coming from this man, words that came with such authority that could make the hard-hearted break down in fear and awe of who he is. Words that would come with such power that demons would tremble just to hear him speak. <clears throat> well, you know what's said about his teaching? It says, all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words which were coming from his mouth. <clears throat> Can you imagine it, brethren? Words that would melt you in a moment. Words spoken of the Lord Jesus that would bring more joy to a discouraged soul than ten lifetimes of unended blessing. Words, brethren, that as you hear them, that would grant you such a degree of hope and truth that you could believe with absolute certainty that you could build your life upon these words and you would not fall. Brother, I don't know about you, but I, I often find myself as I read things in the Gospels saying what I would not give to have seen it, what I would not give to have traded places with one of those 12. And yet, brethren, I come to this passage, and I am thoroughly rebuked. I mean thoroughly rebuked, brethren. Because Jesus says that you are actually the one who is more blessed. Because you haven't seen, and yet you still believe. And brethren, I, that is so hard for me to believe at times. But you know this, brethren, the thing that is so deeply precious in the sight of God is not that we might see and then be, be moved by force or necessity to believe because we have seen, but rather that we would believe and we would trust even if we don't see. But then this is the kind of faith that God loves. In fact, there really is no other kind. I mean, this is what true faith is in the Bible. You find it defined in the scripture. And brethren, it comes so close to what we've already been saying, right? You know what it says there in Hebrews 11. What does it say that faith is? How does it define it? Yes. There's anybody got the rest of it? Yes, there we go. You see, we, in the end, if we didn't have it, we could piece it together, right? 
Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. But then, it might sound like some kind of contradictory statement, but, but real, true, biblical, genuine faith is to be absolutely assured and to have firm conviction in things you haven't seen. What in the world is that? But then that's a miracle of God is what that is. And so that's already sort of what we've been saying, but he goes on and says some more of what we've already been saying, right? He says this, that by this faith, the people of old received their commendation. They received their approval, their blessing from God. And brethren, it is the same for you and I. Just as Jesus is showing us in this beatitude that we've been dealing with, you are commended and blessed by God, just like these saints of old, because you believe in spite of having never seen. But then the glory of this beatitude ought to cause us to, to be, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 6, be of good courage. And he goes on to say that we are to walk by faith and not by sight. And brethren, you know what? This beatitude can cause us to be of good courage, to not walk by sight, but walk by faith, because Jesus says, blessed are you in that position, because you have not seen, and yet you believe. And so we can be of good courage, brethren. And now the last thing I want you to consider is this, the reason for this blessing. Why does Jesus say that those who who have never seen and yet believe are blessed. Well, one reason, brethren, is because the, the, the degree of difficulty in that. It's, brethren, the fact of the matter is, it's far beyond those who have believed because they have seen. In truth, what Jesus is saying here is that your faith is more praiseworthy because you believe without having seen. Brethren, you are blessed because you are like that Roman centurion in the Gospels. You remember what happened with him? He comes to Jesus and he asks him to heal his servant. You know what happens in this passage? It, he tells Jesus that he doesn't even have to come to his house, right? He tells him, you can just say the word and it will be done. You know something, brethren? This man was a Roman. He had not been with Jesus. He didn't follow Jesus around in his ministry. He hadn't seen all these things that the disciples had seen. He didn't hear the teaching coming from the lips of Jesus. And yet this man believes that Jesus can do this. And of course, you know what happens. Jesus marvels at this, right? He praises this man's faith. You know what he says? Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. You're like this man. Who hadn't seen all these things that these disciples had seen, and yet he believed that Jesus could do the very thing he was asking for. And not only did he believe it, brethren, he believed that Jesus didn't even have to be there to do it. That he could just speak the word, and it would just be done. Wherever his servant was, just speak the word, Lord, and he will be healed. Faith, brethren, without sight. You know what you are, brethren? You're blessed because you're like the Bereans. You know what they heard? They heard the word preached by Paul, and they received it with eagerness, even though they had never seen any of the things spoken of by Paul. They had never seen Jesus. They had never seen his works, never seen his ministry, did not see his resurrection, and yet they trusted the words that came from Paul. And you know what it says about the Bereans, brethren? What does it say they were? They were noble. They were more noble. Brethren, I'm telling you, Jesus says the faith of those who have never seen and yet believed is praiseworthy. There's something about it that God glories in. He says they are greatly blessed. Now, hear me on this. This is not to say that those who believe without seeing are somehow better than others in and of themselves. Get this, brethren. The reason why this is a praiseworthy thing the reason why this is such a glorious thing and such a blessed position is because it displays the fact that you believe even though you have never seen, it displays, brethren, the greatest 
act of divine grace that can be seen or known. The fact that God could take a man or a woman who has never seen the things spoken about 2,000 years ago and cause them to believe in them and to base their life on them, even though they have never seen them. Brethren, it's nothing short of an act of supernatural divine grace and an act which surpasses all others. Brethren, you are blessed because you are the recipients of God's powerful grace which causes you to believe even though you have never seen. Brethren, you didn't do that yourself, right? Paul says in Philippians 1.29 that it has been granted to you that you should believe in Him. God has caused you to believe and to remain faithful to Him, even though you have not seen what others had seen. Brethren, this is why the Lord Jesus gives this blessing. And you know what, brethren? This is something we have got to keep in mind here, right? That the sustaining grace, the supernatural sustaining grace of God is more powerful in keeping you faithful to Christ than anything that you might see with your physical eyes. I mean, brethren, it only takes a quick glance at the Scriptures to come to find out that seeing is no guarantee of faithfulness in the Bible. Brethren, the Israelites, I mean, they see some of the most spectacular things you could ever see with your eyes. And yet so quickly they fall back into doubt and, and unbelief. I mean, Giovanni just read that for us out of Psalm 78, right? What does he say? He talks about they, God split the sea in half. And then he split a rock and, flushed, uh, and gushed waters out into the desert. And then he says, food came from heaven. God did these miraculous things in front of these people, brethren. And then it says in verse 32, in spite of all this, they still sinned. Despite his wonders, they did not believe. But then that seems like an impossibility, doesn't it? It seems like there is no way that that could really happen, right? We might think to ourselves, we might think to ourselves that if, if we could see something like the Red Sea, if we could see something like that, God do some kind of miracle, some real tangible proof of the Lord Jesus Christ, something that would make it uh, no longer are we living by faith without sight, but now we're living by faith because we have had sight, that we think to ourselves, if we could just see that, we'd be good. We, we, could, we could live our lives. If we could just see something like that, we could live a life of, of unaltered and undiminished faith for the rest of our days. I mean, brother, am I the only one that's ever thought that kind of thing before? I mean, have you all thought here before, man, if I could just see God do some kind of mir miracle, some kind of miraculous thing, it would transform my whole life. I would be faithful perfectly to the end. But brother, in the scriptures prove to us otherwise. People saw those things. People saw the sea split in two. And I don't even, you can't even imagine what that would have looked like. And they walked across it Walls on either side, and they get to the other side, and what do they do? Oh, they grumble. They doubt. They don't have faith. Brethren, the Scriptures prove to us that seeing is no guarantee of faithfulness. And we might think it is, but it isn't, brethren. I mean, Jesus goes so far to say in the story of Lazarus and the rich man, you know what he says there, brethren? He says that even if they were to see someone rise from the dead, these people would not believe. I mean, I come to that passage and I think, hold on a second. Now that, that might be a little, I think, I think if they saw someone rise from the dead, they might believe. But Jesus says, no, that's not the case. That is not the ultimate thing. Seeing, brethren, is no guarantee. Brethren, you can look no further than Judas himself. 
If you, if you think like me, that you'd give anything to have been able to see it, to be in the position of one of those 12, and that if you were to have seen it, you'd be the most faithful person alive. Brethren, all you have to do is look at this man and realize that he is proof that such things are not the ultimate answer. That seeing is not the ultimate answer to faithfulness. He saw everything, brethren. The miracles, the preaching. He saw his Lord pray. Brethren, he even did much of it himself. And in the end, he's lost. But then the end of the story is this. We think wrongly if we think that somehow seeing will make us more blessed. In fact, we are so wrong that we are on the complete opposite end of where Jesus says the blessing lies. The blessing lies in the fact that you believe even though you don't see. And brethren, you've just got to believe that. You've got to believe those words of the Lord Jesus. You've got to bask in it, brethren. Receive all its benefits, even though you are so far removed, brethren, from what we read in this book. The Lord Jesus looks upon you, and He has joy in your faith, and He blesses you because you remain faithful to Him, even though you have never seen Brethren, this is a glorious text for us to remember. And I want you all to remember it. I, like I said, I've told you, I've come back to this text over and over and over again in my life. As the devil would come and seek to raise doubts, despair, the difficulty, brethren, you know this. And you might not want to, <laughs> in the midst of others, Share the deepest difficulty you have in faith. But the fact of the matter is, you know this, brethren. It, it is difficult at times to walk by faith and not by sight. It is difficult to walk faithfully to Christ in a, in a Christ that we haven't seen. And to base your life on a gospel that was a message preached 2,000 years ago. On a man who died on a cross 2,000 years ago. You have never seen him. And you have never seen any of the things you've read in this book. Brethren, it can be difficult to walk by faith in that at times. But you have to believe this, brethren, that Jesus Christ looks upon you and He says, Blessed are you, because you have not seen and you believe. The Lord Jesus rejoices in your faith. Brethren, so I would bid you to come here and always be encouraged to press on in faith. Let's pray.